All right, uh, I want to say thank you everybody for coming out today. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to welcome Ross Perlin to our Authors at Google program. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Ross for a few years. Um, he's always been working on and uh, thinking about really interesting topics. Um, when I first knew him, he was running a museum uh, of creation destruction uh, that happened to also be running out of a college dorm room. So. Um, that was uh, that was one of my early introductions to Ross, and uh, since then he's always surprised me with the interesting topics that he's, he's tackled. So uh, his latest project is working on a book uh, researching some of the history and phenomenon of internships, uh, and it's one of the first works on this topic to date. So we're very excited today to please welcome Ross Perlin. Thank you, Simon, and. Thank you guys for coming out. Thanks to Google for hosting me. Um, every year, one to two million interns labor in the offices across the United States. They, they shuttle coffee in a thousand newsrooms and make Xeroxes in a thousand congressional offices. But they also deliver aid in Afghanistan. They write newsletters for churches. They, they work on weapons design at Los Alamos. Of course, they're here at Google and throughout Silicon Valley as well. Interns are a pervasive feature of American workplaces now. And there are several million internships each year beyond the US as well, in the developed world and also increasingly in the developing world as well. So this is something which is now in firms of all shapes and sizes as well. I mean, it's, it's you know, uh, white collar, some, to some extent blue collar, for profit, non profit, public sector, private sector. And the project behind this book, Intern Nation, which, is just, which has just come out, was to understand where the phenomenon came from and what some of the larger implications are. Between one-third and one-half of all interns are working unpaid for zero pay. And then there's a substantial portion as well who work for very low stipends, below minimum wage. Tens of thousands of these situations are illegal under US employment law. The, the number of regular full-time workers displaced by the internship phenomenon is is, is uncounted as yet and would be difficult to track, but it's clear that the internship phenomenon is a, is a substantial contributor at this point to structural unemployment and to record levels of youth unemployment, which are hovering near 20% across the developed world. So understanding where internships came from and, and what they mean, I think, is, is, a worthwhile, is a worthwhile project, and I was surprised to find that it hasn't really been done. Every year there's sort of a news cycle, um, you know, come this time, this time of year, May, June, interns marching off to, marching off to the offices this summer. Uh, there's a sort of a literature of self-help books, how-to guides, how to land prestigious internships at, at places, like, places like Google. Uh, but there's nothing that examines the phenomenon systematically, uh, that attempts to kind of map the meaning of internships more broadly in our society and in our economy. So that's the, that's the project. I imagine that everybody in this room uh, has been an intern, has had interns working under them, has had friends who've done internships. This is, this is something which is now simply standard operating procedure at just about any company you can imagine. Um, it's become that the internship is the gateway into the white collar workforce. And the white collar workforce in our economy is where high salaries and positions of prestige are, are increasingly concentrated. Um, it's become, culturally speaking, a kind of rite of passage. There's a sort of social meaning to doing an internship. It's a shared generational experience in many ways, certainly for people under about the age of 40, um, so many of whom have gone through this. 75% of all college students at four-year schools now do at least one internship before graduating. Uh, so it's a complete majority procedure. Now compare that with 1980, something closer to 3% of all students doing at least one internship before graduating. So there's been an internship boom, uh, especially over the last three or four decades. And I'm going to kind of start by talking a little bit about the history. Uh, where did this come from? Uh, what has been the sort of, what have been the mechanisms pushing internships into the mainstream? Um, and then talk a little bit about the kind of sociological meaning of the phenomenon. You know, what, what are interns in our kind of cultural imagination? What, what is their role in the workplace? Talk a little bit about the law, since as I've said, tens of thousands of these things are illegal. 
and nobody seems to know or, or possibly to mind. Um, I'm going to talk about the role of higher education. Internships, historically speaking, have been closely connected to universities, to colleges, to issues of academic credit, to ideas about learning and training. Um, and we're going to kind of explore that a little bit. And, and then finally, I'm going to kind of try to draw out some of the larger effects and implications of the internship boom and uh, discuss why it matters and why it's something that we should be thinking more consciously about as a society and, 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 and for the first time perhaps actually trying to kind of um, plan something more about, about this, this transition from the classroom to the workplace, from school into a career, which right now occurs, occurs very haphazardly uh, in, in the world of internships. So the first interns were medical students and to some extent that uh, that meaning, certainly for my 91-year-old grandfather, when he hears the word intern, he thinks exclusively of a young doctor, somebody who's just finished medical school. Technically, it's the first year of a residency, uh, although the term has actually been, been dropped in a, lot of, in a lot of ways from the field of medicine. Um, and that's, that, that's where this comes from. The end of the 19th century, the word intern was borrowed from, from French, and it was, it, was, it was adopted by the medical profession which was in the process of standardizing its practices, standardizing how you became a doctor, accrediting medical schools and, and accrediting professionals. And by the early 20th century, it had become virtually a requirement for anybody who wanted to become a doctor to take a couple of years, usually, interned within the four walls of a hospital, uh, you know, doing all sorts of things, applying leeches, drawing blood, all kinds of dirty, dirty tasks that the, the full-time regular doctors didn't want to do. Um, and, and then after that, you could sort of proceed into your prestigious and, uh, and, and well-compensated uh, career as a medical professional. Now, medicine and the law have been kind of particular sources for workplace practices in a number of areas, and this is, this is a case of that. Other professions, starting in the 1930s and 40s, look to medicine as, as a sort of source of, of prestigious practices, a place to kind of draw, draw models from. And the first, the first place you see internships popping up outside of medicine is public administration. There's an internship program of sorts launched in the 1930s in Washington, D.C. Uh, in an atmosphere of expanded governance uh, under, under the New Deal and, and FDR's influence, uh, bringing recent graduates from college to Washington, D.C. to train them in, in kind of the, the, the tools of public administration. Uh, then you see corporate America beginning to look to this in the 1940s and 50s major blue chip companies thinking, we need, we need a talent pipeline. We need a way of getting you know, a sort of consistent supply of highly trained young professionals into our companies. We have you know, X number of people that we're hiring each year, so you know, the internship can function as a kind of funnel or, or a kind of, kind of pipeline. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, higher, higher education becomes involved. As with the campus ferment of the, 19, of the 1960s, students begin to think, what can we do beyond the classroom? Uh, how can we apply what we're learning here to the broader world? So schools begin to issue academic credit and begin to kind of arrange internships for, uh, for their students. So there's a kind of idealistic impulse of uh, you know, experiential learning, as it's, as it's called, this, this philosophy of kind of not just learning in the classroom, but learning as a almost as an anthropologist, a, a participant observer in a given workplace, being a fly on the wall and, and sort of soaking up lessons that way. But the real internship boom, as I say, dates from the 1980s, 1990s, and has been accelerating ever since. Even at, even at this juncture, about 1980, an internship is a relatively rare experience. Nobody worked for free in the offices of mid-century America. It was simply not done. It was, it was kind of an unthinkable, an unthinkable thing. There was a strong, clear connection between a, a, fair, a fair wage and an honest day's labor. If you, if you performed the work, you, you earned the reward. Uh, it, was, it was that simple. So it took a kind of generational change in mentality to get, to get people to work unpaid en masse. Um, so one of the things I was most interested in is figuring out how did that, how did that happen? And one thing that, that is particularly relevant, I think, to speak of in, in Silicon Valley is uh, the mentality of free and the idea of what should be free and what should be paid for. Um, as, as the sort of 
my generation, the, 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 the people under 30, under 40, raised in the kind of digital, in digital culture where you know, services are expected to be for free, music collections are <laughs> downloaded for free, services are used for free. Um, there began to be a sort of changed ideas about what should be, what should be paid for. And something strangely parallel happens in terms, of, in terms of labor, in terms of offering up one's work, whether it's you know, budding journalists writing articles for free as a way to kind of break in and get clips or artists putting up their portfolios online, again, offering their work for free with the hope of sort of breaking in. Uh, so there's a kind of culture of, 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 of free or mentality of free, what Chris Anderson calls generational, generation free, uh, that, that also contributes to the internship boom. So the, the, the scope, though, uh, continues, continues to expand despite economic cycles, ups and downs. The number of internships seems to continually grow. It's a rise and rise. Uh, nothing, nothing seems to be able to stop it. And you now have you know, all, kinds of, all kinds of other associated phenomena as well. The rise of, of internship businesses, a whole sector, a whole space, some of which is going on in Silicon Valley, essentially selling internships or, or, or selling internship placements. Uh, there's a company down the road uh, which, which I profile somewhat in the book called University of Dreams. They've now changed their name to Dream Careers, Inc. Uh, well-timed well -timed name change. Uh, and they're offering, for $9,000, they're offering a summer internship uh, for your child in, in London, let's say, or Barcelona at a prestigious sounding place. So internships have become a kind of commodity now, strangely. Uh, there are internship auctions. The, the most absurd of these was a uh, $42,500 paid for a week-long internship with Anna Wintour at Vogue. Uh, so these things are offered up at you know, sort of society events, uh, at fundraisers, and there's something about internships which is so sort of informal. It's, it's, such, a, you know, it's, such, a, it's such a new and, and, and to some extent poorly understood phenomenon, even though it's, even though it's so widespread, uh, that people feel a sort of they, they feel an ability to do things they wouldn't do with regard to regular jobs. You wouldn't auction off a regular job. Uh, you wouldn't deploy connections as aggressively in connection with regular jobs as people do with, with internships. Uh, so this, 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 this book that I've, been, that, I, that I've been working on and which is now sort of being launched into the world, uh, it's really in some sense a first kind of step in this, in this direction because there's no commonly accepted definition of what an internship is, for instance. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is the kind of major body collecting, collecting information about uh, types of work in America and the nature of work in America, uh, solid statistics, doesn't track internships. Uh, the statistics, even the ones that I, the ones that I just cited, are, are at best sort of you know, good, good estimates uh, because there's been almost no academic research on internships, even though they have emerged as the major way for our society to move people from school to work. Um, and they've emerged in that capacity almost without anybody, without any single force pushing them. Um, it's a sort of many-headed monster which has come from many different directions uh, uh, somewhat spontaneously. So speaking, speaking a little then about the, about the kind of sociological meaning of, 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 of the intern, um, it's a kind of curious blend of privilege and exploitation. Because on the one hand, you are offering up your labor for free. And that's, that's something of a novel situation. But on the other hand, obviously, there's a reason why you're, you're doing that and you're in the privileged position of being able to, being able to do that, uh, of being able to pay for your expenses while, while, you, while you work for free, uh, of being able to pay at an internship auction, of being able to afford the academic credit which might be necessary for whatever company it is you want to intern at. Uh, but there's increasingly a, just a kind of negative power surrounding internships. Uh, to not do one is dangerous, but to do one these days is simply standard. When 75% of college students are doing at least one, you need to do multiple. You need to do a sort of ground level internship before you can climb up to a, a more prestigious one. Um, there, there are intern, intern hierarchies uh, at, at, at the larger, larger sort of internship programs. So uh, it's, a, it's, a strange, it's a strange mix and, and contributing to this is the fact that the most famous intern, the only person who is sort of always and ever an intern, is, is Monica Lewinsky. And it's, 
in in some sense, though, she is she is a very typical very typical intern. Just sort of digressing briefly to her to the to the backstory of her internship. She had two back-to-back -back internships in the White House, one of the most competitive, unpaid internship programs in the country, where you have 6,000 people applying each year and only a few hundred being selected. Supposedly, it's a relatively meritocratic internship, but she had family connections, which helped her, helped her land it. And the, the, the time when the sort of Clinton-Lewinsky uh, affair began to unfold, the background for that, the context, was the, the government shutdown of 1995, when the regular staff went home since they were not being paid anymore and the interns were kind of deployed as a, as a, a flexible labor force and were suddenly propelled to the heart of national affairs uh, at, this strange, at this strange moment. So uh, in some sense there, there are a number of particulars of, of, of the Lewinsky, Lewinsky story which, uh, uh, which are actually kind of uh, indicative and, and, and telling about internships. Um, interns are often kind of laughing stocks. They are our favorite peons. I mean, people love to tell, you know, intern jokes and intern stories. There are interns on uh, The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou, Colbert, The Daily Show, uh, you know, all of these, Leno, Letterman, all of these, all of these pop culture references to interns which love to paint them as kind of uh, hilarious, hilarious little minions, little characters that, that can be sort of made fun of. But on the other hand, there's an idea that they might, they might rise in the ranks one day and in turn might end up as, as, your, as your boss. Uh, so it's a kind of, as I say, a curious, a curious mixture of different things. Um, you know, and, and people are always interested to hear the absurd, the absurd intern stories. The person who had to carry their boss's urine samples to, you know, to the boss's doctor. The intern who had to load their own car with, with leaking garbage. Uh, you know, the intern who, for the, for the Daily Show, this, one of the stories that's in the book, had to drive around New Jersey looking for a sumo wrestler's outfit for, for one episode of the show. Um, just absurd, absurd stories. But uh, to some extent, the focus on these, on, these, on these tales of intern woe or sometimes intern glamour can distract us from the, uh, from the larger, kind of larger questions of, of what it means. Um, so to speak a little bit about the law, since I've, since I've said that tens of thousands of internships each year are, are illegal. Uh, it's openly on, on Craigslist, openly on college campuses. Internship listings, internship postings are asking for people with lots of experience to do real work for no money and no training. Uh, so what is the law? and Why is it not better known? And, 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 and what's the situation? Essentially, interns are protected under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is a piece of New Deal legislation which is, is central to all the rights that American workers have, to the minimum wage, to overtime. Uh, it's, it's also the piece of legislation which blocked, uh, blocked child labor uh, and, and, and set, set basic standards for, for working conditions. Um, but about a decade after uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed, the Supreme Court opened up a tiny, tiny little loophole. This is in the 1940s. Uh, through which many illegal internships have, have, have since tried to pass. Basically, there was a case, a case came up, this was not, this didn't involve interns, uh, interns themselves were a relative rarity at the time, um, but it involved trainees and the question of whether trainees need to be paid or not. And so the Supreme Court developed a test which would determine is somebody really a trainee or are they really a worker, which is a subtle sort of thing, not necessarily easy to determine. But they laid out six criteria, which are now applied to the question of, 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 of internships. And basically what the criteria state is that the training has to resemble what you would see in a vocational school. It has to be real training, and the, it has to be primarily for the benefit of, of the trainee, read intern in this, in this case, and there, there has to be no immediate advantage derived by the by the employer from what the from what the trainee is doing, so it lets out it sets out a, a fairly strict test uh, to basically say this really has to be a classic trainee situation, uh, or else the intern the trainee is a worker. If they're doing real work and it's it's for the benefit of 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 the employer and their business, there has to be there has to be pay. So very few internship programs currently would pass this test. Uh, I mean, paid internships, 
you know, paid minimum wage or above don't have a problem here um, because in the eyes of the law, it's simply a kind of category of worker. But in unpaid, for unpaid internships, it, basically the threshold, the burden is, is, on the, is on the employer to show this is essentially a training program. We are essentially doing training. But the reality that I found through hundreds of interviews uh, in, in the book with, with interns, with employers, uh, and with many others, is that interns are in many cases doing real work, whether that's menial or whether it's writing speeches for senators or, 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 or working on the Human Genome Project. Uh, that's, work that, that's work that needs to be paid for. But of course, interns are, are afraid to report these situations or they don't know the law. Uh, they're the youngest, in many cases, some of the most vulnerable people in the workplace. They're trying to get a foot in the door. They're working for a recommendation or, or, or a reference or, or, or a connection down the line. And, um, and in many cases, they know what they're getting into. And then there's a kind of barter occurring where you know, you're, giving your, you're giving your time, you're giving your free labor in exchange for some, some nebulous hoped for outcome at the end. Um, so that, that, that can work very well in the case of uh, you know, an internship program that really is training focused where 50, 60, 70 percent of an intern class is being hired uh, at the end of the internship. And that was the sort of, that was the sort of classic blue chip company internship. Um, but what has emerged increasingly is the use of, the use of, of, of interns as, as, a, as a labor savings, uh, as a way to save on costs to the tune of $2 billion each year in the US uh, alone. And basically being able to deploy interns as, as Monica Lewinsky was deployed and the other White House interns were deployed to, um, to step in and fill, fill, fill the breach. Uh, or to you know uh, extend greatly extend the capacities of an organization. Um, now the the nonprofit world is slightly different, but in some ways equally or more notorious in terms of in terms of the use of the use of interns. Um, nonprofits can legally take on volunteers, unlike for-profit companies. But there is a there is a there's an extensive test for what constitutes a volunteer. And interns usually don't meet it. Usually interns are people trying to get ahead in the workplace. They're not offering up out of a spirit of volunteerism their own, you know, a little bit of their own free time. But the word, the word intern is, is used by, by employers to, to attract people. Um, it's, it's a kind of buzzword to, to get people to, you know, commit to more regular hours, to get people to, you know, feel that they, uh, feel that they have something at stake, whereas volunteers more likely to sort of feel that they can come and go. But um, the whole explosion of civil society uh, in, in many cases over the last 30 or 40 years has, uh, has ridden on volunteerism and to some extent on, on interns. Uh, the you know, nonprofits with four regular full-time staff and 10 interns greatly extending the capacities of the organization. Um, and you, know, you, see this, you see this especially in Washington, D.C. where, you know, is sort of famously an intern hub every summer, not only in the offices of, uh, of Congress, where there's a special exemption which Congress passed for itself very quietly, saying that their interns don't have to be paid, um, but also in all the think tanks and all of the, all the nonprofits and other organizations which have kind of sprung up in the, in the, in the Beltway. Um, so that's kind of one side of the law. The other side, even more sort of sinister, is that unpaid interns are not protected in the same way that other workers are. So sexual harassment, racial, ethnic, et cetera, discrimination, these things, these, the protections that have been put in place around these issues don't apply to unpaid interns because unpaid interns are, are, are invisible to the law. They're essentially seen as bystanders who happen to be holding down a desk, who happen to be at a cubicle. Uh, and this has to do with an obscure bit of, 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 of common law which uh, which holds that if you're not getting paid, then maybe you're not really an employee. Um, so you've had, we've had many, many suits at this point by former interns, especially who've been sexually harassed because the gender dynamics uh, with internships tend to be, uh, tend to be somewhat, somewhat creepy in, in, in cases. And 77% of unpaid interns are women, according to one study, uh, which is a, a complicated issue in and of itself. Um, but these cases that, that, that interns have brought are never listened to, are never heard by the courts. They're thrown out. The interns are seen not to have standing um, as employees, and so the merits of their cases are not even heard. 
So that's, that's the kind of legal situation. And you might be surprised hearing all this that, that colleges and universities have helped to power the internship race, that, that they are there lending their, their credibility uh, and, and, and being complicit in, in, this, in this internship boom. Um, and one of the principal ways is through the use of academic credit. Academic credit is a very strange currency. Uh, it's something that people haven't really given enough thought to, I think. Um, it's over a century old, and it's, it's very unevenly kind of uh, convertible across, across the world of higher education. Each school or each, each, each system has its own kind of regulations with regard to academic credit, and there's you know, sort of wide differences in where academic credit is accepted from whom. Uh, but many, many schools are, are granting academic credit for internships uh, because it can form a very significant, cheap way to, to provide credits and, and it's becoming a major revenue stream. So here's the scenario, just to put it in kind of concrete terms. I go work for an employer, unpaid, six month unpaid internship, let's say. And the employer says, if you want to be our intern, you are required to obtain academic credit from your, from your institution. I go to my institution and I say, I need these credits. They say those credits cost $4,000, $5,000. They are treated virtually the same as the kinds of credits for classes, for other academic activities. So the school has, doesn't have to provide anything, essentially. They don't provide a, a professor in most cases. They don't provide classrooms. They don't provide the facilities. You're going off campus and working unpaid, full-time or part-time, whatever it is, for this employer, and, and paying the school in order to work unpaid. Um, and schools have been very sort of disingenuous about this, not, not acknowledging that this is, that this is a, widespread, a widespread practice now. Uh, and there are various workarounds which, which people try, but. The, the, the strange system which has grown up is connected to the legal issues that we were just discussing. So the, the employers are under the impression that they can have unpaid internships if academic credit is somehow involved. And they say, well, we don't offer pay, but we offer academic credit. You'll see this from major Forbes 500 companies. They can't offer academic credit. Companies don't issue academic credit, at least yet. Uh, <laughs> Who knows what, what will happen in the future. But at this point, that has to be something issued by the school. And so then there's this, this, this very strange three-way dance, essentially, which ends up you know, leaving, leaving the student and his or her family holding, holding the bill, subsidizing, in many cases, major corporations, while the school stands by and kind of lends its approval and premature to the whole process. 95% of colleges and universities allow the posting of unpaid internships on their campuses. You'll see them, you know, you'll see flyers for them, you'll see internship weeks, internship fairs, um, you'll see them on career counseling websites. Uh, there's very little about the legal issues that I just mentioned that, that, that is circulating on campuses or put out there by, by career centers. Uh, and they, they, they see this as sort of their turf and have little regard for, for, for the relevant employment law, have little regard for the idea that their students are also workers, their students are also working. Um, so it's, uh, complicity I think is the, is, is, is the, word that, the word that comes to mind, but uh, higher education is, is very much a part of this. Um, so let me kind of move on to, so what? The implications, um, the question of why this matters more broadly. For any given individual, an internship, an unpaid internship, even one where they're, they're paying for academic credit, might make sense. If it's something they can afford, if it's something they can double down on loans, they can work as a bartender the rest of the time, make sacrifices, get it done, it may work for them. And, and indeed, you know, to not have an internship in many fields is, can be the kiss of death. But more systemically, more broadly, what are the, what are the impacts of this? Um, one thing that you know, one thing that to me to me comes to, comes to mind first is is the issue of social mobility, and essentially this this needing to pay to work blocks a whole segment of people who can't afford who can't afford to do that from entering from entering uh, the white collar workforce where high level jobs are concentrated, and and, and particularly kind of particularly striking uh, is how this changes the complexion of certain professions. 
and it's especially the professions that matter most in terms of influence in, in society. Politics, film, journalism. Uh, these, 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 these areas where having a diversity of voices, having people from a variety of backgrounds might be most crucial, uh, are the ones which are saying, you want to enter this profession? You need an unpaid internship. And lots of people look at that, especially people who don't, who don't go to college at all, especially people in community colleges, but even people from lower income backgrounds in four-year colleges, they look at that requirement, they look at the prospect of needing to do two, three, four unpaid internships to break in, and they say, I, I, I can't do this. They, they, they get a signal at that crucial stage from this system that they're simply not going to be able to enter those, those, those ranks. And it's just playing itself out, but in 20, 30 years, the commanding heights of the economy, the, the sort of most influential professions will be occupied largely, and this is already beginning to happen, by, by former interns, by people who could afford to do this, uh, by people who could go through that, that rite of passage. So I kind of, uh, I want to close by just proposing that, uh, and, and then take any questions and have a, have a bit of a discussion, uh, proposing that internships provide an intriguing kind of keyhole into a number of things that are, that are happening in our society, in higher education, in the workforce, in the labor market. Um, internships are part of the story of delayed adulthood, which has been re receiving some attention. The idea that uh, fewer and fewer people in their 20s are achieving these m classic milestones, living on your own, getting married, having children, um, owning, owning, a, owning a house. Uh, fewer and fewer people are achieving these things, and, and, and it's, it's creating this kind of delayed, this, this prolonged adolescence, this, this phenomenon of delayed adulthood. And internships are one of the places, or one of the, one of the factors at work. Um, internships are part of the rise, more largely, of what's often called contingent forms of labor. So interns are, in some sense, just, this is just one piece of a picture that includes freelancers, permalancers, temps, permatemps, uh, independent contractors, certain kinds of self-employed and irregular workers. The classic prototypical image of work, which, which many of us still have in our heads, you know, of, of somebody kind of waking up and, and you know, 9 a.m. they go to the office and 5 p.m. They, they come back and they, you know, work for that employer for an extended period of time and that employer provides health insurance and, 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 and pension plans and this sort of thing. That's becoming a, a relative rarity. And you know, something like a third of, of all workers in the developed world at this point, the U.S. and Western Europe uh, in, in particular, are, are contingent in one sense or another, are in some sense moving from one gig to another without longer term sense of job security. And the impact of that, uh, of course, it's felt unevenly uh, for, for a graphic designer who makes $100 an hour and loves their freedom, it can be wonderful, for an unpaid intern who has no other options, it can be horrible. But, but contingency in the labor force is another major issue that internships are, are a kind of keyhole into. So my, my, my aim just with this, with this, with this discussion and, and in the book more generally is just to kind of bring this topic out of, the, out of the shadows, to make internships which are clearly of such importance uh, in, in, in this question of how do you move people from Psych 101 lectures into, you know, roles in the workforce, important roles in the workforce, driving, driving innovation and, 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 and propelling the economy forward. How do you get that done? Internships have emerged as the kind of de facto most popular default solution, but, but nobody's really examined how we, could, how we could improve the system, how we could eliminate the, the, the waste and the injustice that, uh, that, that, that it brings. So, uh, so my hope is that we can begin a discussion uh, in which we, we, we think of this as, a, as an issue of rational public policy. We can bring internships out of the shadows and into public discourse. Thank you. Uh, so I'd love, yeah, I'd love to kind of hear any questions and have a discussion. So the first question is about why, yeah, why the topic has been in the shadows for a long time. 
Um, I think it's a strange thing because interns, on the one hand, you know, everybody has done one, knows somebody who's done one, or has a, has a child who has been one. Um, it's something which has been completely naturalized. It's something that we take for granted. Um, and we have no good statistics. So many, so many academics, many economists and sociologists don't want to get involved because it's kind of this messy, this messy topic. There's no, there's no solid definition which, which has been put out there. Again, partly because the phenomenon has, has not been directed by anybody in particular. It's been kind of motivated from all sorts of different directions. You have you know, young people clamoring for them, hearing that they, they need to get an internship, parents pressuring them to do so, companies seeing it as a way, depending on what kind of company it is, either to kind of ensure a, a talent pipeline or to save on labor costs. And you have schools getting involved because, uh, because they're, they're, there might be revenue at stake or because they think it's beneficial to their students or for a variety of reasons. So. Um, I think it's been in the shadows because nobody knew where to start. Nobody knew how to kind of conceive of this, of this, of this sprawl of chaotic activity that's going on. Um, that's kind of the best. That's kind of the best answer I can I can give. But um, but I'm hoping that kind of increasingly I, I I'm aware now of several academic research projects on the topic. What do interns actually learn? What happens to you know? What's the impact of internship experiences over a lifetime in terms of in terms of earnings and in terms of a career trajectory. Uh, so I'm hoping that, that it's going to begin to change. Second question about Europe and uh, sort of comparative, comparative studies. Uh, the book is, is mostly focused on the US, but I, have a, I do have a chapter about the globalization of internships. And that has been a much more recent phenomenon, the last, really the last 10 years, the last 10, 20 years or so. And I particularly look at, uh, at China and, and how internships have been adopted and why and what are the vectors of, of transmission. Generally speaking, uh, one major difference is that higher education has not been very involved um, in other countries. It's particularly in the US where schools have decided this is their turf or this is something where they have, they have something particularly at stake. Whereas in Western Europe, schools still usually have the mindset that you know, school is one thing, work is another, and um, you know, they, that's beyond their ken, beyond their bailiwick. Um, the other major interesting difference has been the kind of reaction, especially in Western Europe, to the rise of, uh, of this new norm of having to work unpaid. There's been a lot more resistance. There's been much more of a culture of, we need to be paid. Uh, at the same time, companies have, 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 multinational companies have taken internships abroad. Uh, that's been one of the major ways that they've spread through multinationals, also through uh, through, through Americans going abroad and asking for internships or, or talking about internships or, or people from other countries coming to the U.S. and, and seeing, seeing internships as a kind of prestigious part of uh, prestigious American business practice or a prestigious part of the educational experience. Um, so it's, it's spread in many different ways, but, but in, in Western Europe there's been resistance and, and there's now some of the things that I'm kind of talking about or calling for are now happening in, in France and the U.K. Uh, where in France there's now, there's now a law saying that at, at least at the point of three months you can no longer be an unpaid intern. That clearly when you've been working for three months somewhere it's no longer a trainee situation, it's, it's real work. It's displacing regular workers and it needs to, there needs to be at least a kind of basic, basic wage there. In the UK uh, the focus has been on issues of social mobility. And, uh, and, and on internships, needing to make the, the, need, the need to make internships more about what you know rather than who you know and trying to, uh, trying to make um, application processes and things like that more transparent because internships are kind of notoriously backdoor as I, as I kind of alluded to. Uh, so so there, are some, there are some differences but overall uh, it's becoming a global practice. Uh, there are only a few sort of developed countries where it hasn't really taken hold places with very, you know, much stronger kind of traditions around labor and, and being, being paid, you know, being paid to work and valuing, valuing labor. But, um, but generally speaking, it's, it's, it's spreading, it continues to spread. Can you give me a sense of um, how much of the workforce in America is in a field where unpaid internships are, are prevalent because you, you've mentioned three, it seems like a fairly small portion of the workforce and quite quickly, I've never known anybody who has done an unpaid internship, then again, I live here. Right, um, I think there's a very stark, a very stark divide between 
Um, or there's a kind of spectrum in a sense, all the way from usually kind of engineering, uh, computer science based things where the majority, the vast majority of internships are paid, uh, including also finance and investment banking. Um, but then as you move, as you move into, into fields like architecture or fields like public relations, it's about an even split, 50% paid, 50% unpaid. Um, and then when, once you get into areas like communications, marketing, uh, regardless, in many cases, regardless of the industry, the majority of those internships, again, are, are unpaid. Uh, I've, I've, I focused on or alluded to a bit the so-called so glamour professions, uh, fashion, film, politics, media, but, um, and, and, and those in some cases are, 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 are the most outrageous. But, um, but it's really, I mean, it's really very widespread. In the nonprofit world, the majority of internships are unpaid also, about 60%. In, in government, in different government, um, different levels of government, federal, state, city, et cetera, it's about half and half, kind of even split. And uh, one of the general trends, I mean, you know, internships, it, it, even within a given a single employer, even within a single office, you'll have both paid and unpaid. And you know it's often based on what what subjects have been studied uh, by the by the prospective intern, uh, based on you know, what kinds of what kinds of skills they're thought to be bringing, based on some ideas about the supply and demand. Um, you know if it's if it's some particularly hot field, you know where there's a real war for talent on. Sure, they're much more likely to be paid. Um, but um, but overall, I mean, you would be surprised sometimes to find out that, for instance, the field of of, of game design. Um, I don't know exactly what that, what that includes, but there was a study showing that something like only 10% of, of interns in that field are paid. In areas like animation, um, you know, animation studios in New York City, the norm is that those people be unpaid, even though they're highly skilled. They're bringing a lot of skills to the table. In areas like photography, for instance, would be another example. People working for photographers. Um, you know, even people who've piled up a lot of skills and a lot of, have a lot sort of under their belts, needing to work unpaid. Uh, so. It's, it, is, it is widespread, and, and the, there, there's a kind of a spectrum uh, that you have to look at. Um, so it, one of the chapters of your book, you look at, uh, you profile Disney World and the internships there. Um, and I, I'm curious, you know, one, you speak a little bit more about that, and also what was it like writing about Disney? Uh, I don't get the sense that they're a company that really uh, is really excited about transparency. You know, what was that like to do that research? Yeah, uh, the question is about about Disney World and its many tentacles. Um, so I repeatedly tried to get Disney to comment for the book, uh, talk to me, just sort of respond to some questions, and uh, we did have communication. But they ultimately decided they were not going to participate in any way uh, with what I was doing for the book. Disney World has one of the largest internship programs in the world. Um, this is just speaking about Disney World in Orlando, which is the largest single site employer, uh, even though you guys here are probably giving them a run for their money, but they have 60, 63,000 employees on site at Disney World. Disney World is, I mean, it's a vast complex of kind of miniature cities, transportation systems, dozens of hotels, um, multiple you know, theme parks. It's not just the sort of magic kingdom that one might think of immediately. Uh, so out of those 63,000, 7 to 8,000 each year are interns. And interns are in every role, essentially. Uh, interns are dressed up in the fuzzy costumes, as Mickey and Donald. Interns pick up trash and flip burgers. They do the same work that regular full-time employees do. Um, so I went down to Orlando uh, to, to sort of check it out for myself and to talk to, to talk to interns, to talk to regular employees to talk to the union leaders in some cases who've been, who've been trying to fight this because some portion, a large portion of the full-time workforce at Disney is, is unionized. Um, and a very strange picture emerged. Um, there are intern complexes, little sort of miniature intern cities where a few thousand, you know, in, in one complex, a few thousand interns will be housed at a time. Uh, there's a massive use of uh, cultural exchange visas to bring over a thousand international international interns into uh, into Disney World each year to under the guise of cultural exchange to to flip burgers and, and pick up trash. The responsibilities of interns are are literally no different. The amount of training they receive, which is almost nil, is literally no different from um, <laughs> uh, from what from what regular employees have. 
So um, at the same time, many, many people enjoy it. They are paid minimum wage. It's not, it's not an illegal, unpaid program. It, it just sort of s skirts, especially with those visa situations, skirts the law. Um, but, um, but there's also, as usual, the main way that interns kind of protest or react is by voting with their feet. Massive churn. Um, 20 to 30 percent probably leaving before their, before their term ends. Um, and the other strange feature of the program that, that particularly kind of attracted me to go, to go research it and to kind of, um, you know, sort of just sneak around different parts of Disney World and talk to people as, as, as best I could was that it has this whole kind of educational fig leaf to it. That there's this claim that flipping burgers and, and picking up trash is just as educational as anything else. Um, and there are all kinds of educators and universities which have signed up to essentially promote and, and promote the program and recruit for Disney on, 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 on their campuses. So Disney is seeing massive savings from this because they're able to use this kind of minimum wage uh, force every, every year, very kind of flexible, eager, eager labor force, rather than see their regular employees kind of, than have more regular employees who, uh, you know, are, would be required under, under their rules to get certain pay raises each year. Uh, so it's, it's massively useful for them. They've involved the schools in order to bring it up to scale so that they have literally thousands of, of campuses around the country kind of uh, spreading, you know, spreading the word about this program and helping them recruit so that they can you know, get seven to 8,000 people to go down there on their own dime each year and uh, you know, flip burgers and dress up as Mickey uh, as interns. <laughs> right, great talk. Um, Thanks. So you, you made the point about the law and whatnot, and um, you know, laws can be changed, especially when people aren't looking. So I think uh, what doesn't really bother me personally uh, is not the, the pay as whether people are being exploited or not. Um, so I was wondering what sort of practices are common for companies to self-regulate exploitation, and what do you think works, and what do you think is kind of a joke? Uh, one thing that, that, that has worked I think surprisingly well and is promising uh, is industries taking on taking on the issue and kind of issuing codes of conduct and 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 self-regulating uh, what what happens just within the industry. So a professional association like um, the American Institute of Architects is the example that I kind of profile the most. Uh, it used to be that in the field of architecture you would be working multiple years unpaid, uncredited, uh, you know, and that it was seen as it was seen as this rite of passage, something you had to do, and if you weren't willing to do it, you should, you know, you sort of need to get out. Uh, and it reached such levels that the professional association and the major kind of uh, organization of architecture students and young professionals uh, issued a code of conduct, basically saying that, you know, if you don't adhere to these basic rules, paying your paying your interns and treating them, you know, in line in the basic same terms as regular regular employees. Um, tackling these issues like sexual harassment and discrimination. Um, if you exploit your interns, you will be, in a sense, blacklisted uh, in the profession from, you know, speaking at kind of key events, uh, from, you know, potentially even from belonging to the major professional organization. And the public relations field, it seems like, is just beginning to also embrace this model of kind of self-regulation at the level of, a, of an industry. Uh, a lot of people don't think very much about these professional organizations. What you know? What do they actually do? What what is their what is their value? But this is a case where if the professional organization is strong, uh, they can really they can really do something about it. Individual companies, um, there's obviously a, a lot a lot that they can do as well. Uh, and there are a lot of companies that have that have model model programs and essentially you know treat their treat their interns as as regular employees and 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 have uh, you know dedicated internship coordinator coordinators and. Uh, and have you know policies surrounding internships that that do a fair amount to to, uh, to protect them from that kind of exploitation. So there's a lot that can be done in that direction. I didn't I didn't get to sort of issue this, the solutions to this to this malaise uh, in 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 the short time that, that we had here now. There's a chapter on it in the book, but um, I see it as needing to come from kind of multiple stakeholders that are involved in this, uh, from young people who are engaged in a kind of senseless race to the bottom in many cases, uh, you know, offering up their labor for free for extended periods of time, uh, to, to parents pressuring, pressuring their children to do these things, to schools charging people to work unpaid and for, um, you know, almost flogging uh, illegal positions on their, on their, on their campuses, um, but then also to, to companies and, 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 and whole professions 
um, and, and government uh, enforcing, enforcing the law, uh, potentially changing the law or having some kind of internship specific law or regulation. Um, but in any case, I think the change will have to come from a number of different directions to kind of improve the whole, the whole system slowly but surely. It's it's uh, the situation in China is still kind of emergent, and uh, the term in Chinese for um, for intern is still kind of the same term as trainee, shi uh, So it's it hasn't yet kind of I mean, people will, will use the English word intern as well, but it hasn't yet emerged as a completely separate category. Uh, the kind of initially this was something which was clearly being brought by multinational multinational companies coming in and you know. A major, uh, say, a major consulting firm, a major bank. They'll have interns in their in their head office. They'll have major interns in in Zurich and in Beijing and in Johannesburg and in Cairo. And so, it was something simply, you know, when they're setting up a new office, this is something they simply bring to the table. Uh, and then you have, you know, huge numbers of Chinese students studying in, in the U.S., uh, returning returning to China, bringing ideas about about internships back with them. Uh, individual universities. There's a Harvard China internship program where. You know, Harvard and, and there are a couple of other schools doing doing something similar. Uh, Stanford has something in, in East Asia as, as well, where they're uh, specifically kind of using the connections of the school to place students in prestigious internships in in China or or throughout throughout East Asia. So all of these things have contributed to kind of heightened awareness and, and uh, uh, understanding of kind of the internship culture. And then on top of that, you have study abroad. Programs, uh, for-profit, non-profit, study abroad schemes, which uh, are now offering internships as a kind of you know level beyond sheer sheer studying, sheer coursework in in China or in another country. So in China, at at, at this point, it's um, uh, there's it's 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 a rampant rampant connections based kind of kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, and to some extent, the American practice of internships is bringing a relatively more kind of uh, open, transparent process to it. But, uh, but I think, yeah, it's, it's still very much unfolding, but it's, it's now kind of coming, it's, it's widespread already in Shanghai and Beijing and, and even Shenzhen, and it's, it's coming even to kind of regional, regional cities now. So. Um, I'm trying to weave kind of two parts together here. You talk about how the, the whole unpaid internship culture kind of would, would lead to certain socioeconomic groups being benefited, and, and so that being reflected in the profession. Um, if I'm right in understanding, I was at the point that your kind of understanding is that most, if not all, unpaid internships are fundamentally in violation of the law. I, I don't want to. Most, Most okay. yeah. Some some are are training programs to such an extent that, you know, there's no problem with them. But okay. Yeah. So, assuming we were to move all of those unpaid illegal internships into the paid, I would assume that would probably cut the number of internships and make getting one more dependent on connections. Is there is there a risk that doing so would actually even further uh, the Exclusion of certain of the account groups from some projects based on there aren't as many internships because they all have to be paid at this point. I I think I think there would be a problem with immediately just trying to flip the switch and turning paid I mean turning unpaid internships into paid internships. You're right. The same the same networks that uh, that 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 snap up snap up the best internships now would snap those up. Uh, and indeed, uh, one study showed there's a kind of stereotype of interns as being from wealthy, wealthy backgrounds or uh, having born with a silver spoon in their mouths. But in fact, it's people who get the paid internships uh, who are largely from wealthier backgrounds, and unpaid internships largely skew to people from uh, from more middle-income backgrounds. Now, the the, the very bottom uh, of the social ladder is is generally you know completely excluded. But uh, I I agree that simply changing kind of unpaid to paid. Uh, is not the whole answer, and that you have to kind of tackle the um, tackle the issue of connections, and the, the the basic issues of, of access, and um, uh, there there are, there are a number of solutions out there. There are community organizations, for instance, that um, one of which called Inroads that I that I know has worked with 
I know has worked with Google, which aims at bringing minority students into, uh, from minority students who've just graduated high school and going into college, bringing them kind of into high-powered internships. Um, so there are a number of possible solutions, but I, but I, uh, I, I agree with you that that's a risk. In terms of, in terms of the question of um, internships, uh, you know, affecting kind of social mobility and, and, and the, the complexion of certain professions, um, I think that's kind of, in some ways, the core, the core, the core, the core point of the book. So I hope that's what gets through beyond the kind of issue, you know, beyond the sob stories, beyond the individual cases. Um, last question. Yeah. Um, I you talked about internships as being sort of the gateway between college and the workforce, and um, I I don't know if you've mentioned this in the book, but I know internships people often talk about how it's a resume builder, but then not necessarily full of content. Like the stuff that you're learning is not. And people talk about failed internships all the time. They come back after the summer, and you have students, and they're like, well, you know. Um, so I was an unpaid intern myself. That was, in some sense, the genesis of, of the book six years ago. Although I don't have a, I don't have a long. I'm not some disgruntled, you know, former intern with a long sob story. I just kind of, it was just a point of departure for me. And when I was doing it, I met a fellow intern who said, the best thing about internships is that you can spin them. That they're a world of spin. And I think it's true that their internships are inflating resumes, you know. Across the country, and and on often there's often there's 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 not that much content. That there wasn't much training involved, or, or the work was, uh, the work was relatively menial, which is which which would is, is fine if there's pay involved and if that's known in advance that that's what the content of the work is. But um, I think people have used the word internship to kind of give an elevated sound to to what they've done, and it, you know it has a kind of prestigious white collar ring to it. It signals somebody who's who's on the way up or, or you know thinks they're on the way up or um, is is kind of starting their starting their career off on a, a go-getter sort of foot. Uh, but I think I think what it leads to is internships becoming something of a broken signal in terms of hiring. Uh, if employers start seeing these you know CVs with five, six internships on them, uh, they see everybody's having internships, they begin to lose their they begin to lose their meaning. Um, and nobody knows what they're really about or what the content, what the content is. So I, I agree that a big part of the wastefulness of this system, a big part of why, of why it's in need of reform is that th these experiences, that there's nothing kind of, there's very little that's standardized about them, there's very little that's known about their content in many cases. Um, and, uh, and again, it's just kind of a revolving door of, uh, of, of, of cheap labor in many cases for, for companies. And so they're not paying a lot of attention to the nature of the experience. Of course, there are some that are, but uh, too many that aren't. So I think we have to leave it at that. But thank you guys again for coming. And I uh, uh, hope you enjoy the book if you get a chance to look at it. <laughs>